Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Candace Summers and I'm the Director of Community Education at the McLean County Museum of History. And I am thrilled to welcome everyone to today's webinar on Abraham Lincoln and the heritage of Illinois State University. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanna go over a, a quick format for today's program. We are recording today's program so that people who cannot join us today can watch it later. So we will load this to our YouTube page uh, like we've done with many of our other webinars before. If you have a question for our speakers, please submit them in the Q&A box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And the questions will be answered at the end of the program. If you're having a technical issue, say with sound, please drop a comment in the chat box and I will see if I can resolve the issue. And also, if you like today's program and wanna see the museum host more, both in-person, hybrid and online, and you're not already a member, please do consider joining uh, the McLean County Museum of History. Our members, our donors are who help us continue to bring quality educational program and free like today's. So I dropped a, a link for our membership in the chat box today. And now I am pleased to introduce today's speakers accomplished freelance writer and historical researcher, Tom Emery, an ISU alum and history enthusiast and retired lawyer, Carl Kasten, who will share information about Lincoln's close ties to ISU, a topic of which has largely gone ignore, largely been ignored in the 156 years since Lincoln's death. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Tom Emery and Carl Kasten. Thank you very much, Candace. We're glad to be here today. Uh, we are coming to you from the Carnival Public Library, which is 112 miles south of Bloomington. I'm on the board of the Carnival Public Library. We're joined by our technical expert. She kind of laughing us at Nadia Call, who's our children's co-librarian, who's been setting us up today, so we're happy to have her today. Um, I'm going to talk about myself in terms of Carl for a few minutes and then come back uh, to more on the program. As Ken said, I'm a freelance writer and historical researcher. I've had byline articles in over 150 newspapers. I've done 37 book and booklet titles. Uh, I've done uh, over about 160 uh, various speaking engagements in different formats. Zoom is still kind of new to me in the last 10 years or so. Uh, but Carlinville is a town of 5,200. We've been in town of about 5,200 for the last 100 years or so. Uh, I always laugh at my audiences that we used to have the only stoplight in Coopan County for a lot of years. Now we have four out of the six, so that's progress for you, I guess. We, had one, we have one of the stoplights just outside the library, so we're kind of in downtown Carlinville. But we're, I mentioned my 37 book, <laughs> book of titles. Uh, a number of those I've done on Civil War, Illinois history, and Lincoln-related topics, which is kind of the... Um, uh, focus a lot of my research efforts. Over 15,000 books have been written on Abraham Lincoln. It's been said that the only individual written about more in world history than Abraham Lincoln is Jesus Christ. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's well deserved. Because Lincoln is the greatest president in American history. In my view, there's not really a close second. Uh, readers around the world are fascinated with Abraham Lincoln. He's one of the greatest figures, not only in American history, but world history as well. And yet there's so much left to be written on him. Uh, it's been, I've heard people say everything on Lincoln has been written, it could possibly be written, and there's no new material left. Too much of Lincoln, we see new books on Lincoln Day as rehash. It's just the uh, same topics written over and over again, maybe from different angles. There's plenty more that needs to be covered, and that's one reason we're talking about the book we have here today. Um, something was said to me in one of my engagements about three and a half years ago, it really stuck in my mind. A uh, lady who invited me to this particular talk, I was doing one of my programs on Lincoln. I do two full programs on Lincoln in addition to this one. Told me that just when you think you know everything about Lincoln, you learn something more. And I was really struck by that comment. The first part is wrong. The greatest scholars are still learning. And they'll tell you there's a lot more that needs to be written and researched on Abraham Lincoln. There's always something new to learn. Uh, it's one of my primary focuses of what I do in my research to break new ground. I love doing that. Look at fresh angles, right about stories need to be told. And this was one, certainly. Uh, Lincoln's many connections to Illinois State University had not been covered. Uh, there have been a few past mentions on his role in the founding university. I found a six-page article that was written in 1956. But that was about the depth of, of analysis on Lincoln's connections to Illinois State University. 
which is such a great national university and one of the hallmarks of education here in Illinois, the first public university in Illinois history. But there was such more, so much here, there's new ground, especially Lincoln studies, as well as the rich history of Illinois State. Uh, we thought this might be a hundred page work. Uh, we found more and more, it ended up being 288 pages. Uh, demonstrates the importance of, of Lincoln to the story of Illinois State. There's only one university in the world that Abraham Lincoln had a direct role in founding, and Illinois State University is it. So for all of you ISU grads listening today, you're it. You have that honor. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, the gentleman who's a lifelong friend, lifelong family friend, who thankfully asked me to do this, this project. I'm so grateful. That's Mr. Carl Castle. I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Candace. Good afternoon. My name is Carl Caston, um, and I'm honored to be with you and um, the Historical Society of McLean County today. Uh, I have a very close relationship with Illinois State University. Uh, I was a student there from 1962 to 1966. Um, I got engaged on the quad to my wife of uh, 56 years, uh, Donna, on uh, that campus. It was my honor to uh, serve in student government and later on um, as a uh, member of the Board of Regents. And then uh, in 1996, when we got our own board, uh, the Board of Trustees, and it was uh, an honor to serve as president of that board the last uh, five years of my uh, tenure there. There's another reason that I'm close to the university, and that is, of all places you would think a downstate lawyer would not be sworn in, I was sworn in in the very building where your museum is, and in October of 1969, by then uh, Justice uh, Robert Underwood, um, whom I had met uh, as a student, oddly enough, when um, he and I both attended the same church when uh, I was a student there. So I have many contacts with uh, Bloomington Normal and with the university. I uh, went to Northwestern Law School and graduated there in 1969 and um, have practiced law for 48 years. All the time that I've been dealing with this, I knew that I had a deep love for both the university and for Abraham Lincoln for any number of policy reasons and um, any number of personal reasons. The university has given us some wonderful histories of, uh, by its professors. I'm thinking of John Freed and uh, Helen Cavanaugh and Lucy Tasher and a whole bunch more, all of whom had the general broad text of the, the swath of, of uh, ISU history about them, but who were not commissioned to do and so far as I know, none of them have done a uh, narrow focused um, analysis of the intertwining of Lincoln and the university. Um, those scholars gave me lots of uh, fodder as a student, and I uh, thank the world and all of them. I'm going to mention one other name, Guy Fraker, who is the uh, uh, a Bloomington lawyer who I know, who is, I think, the unchallenged uh, uh, king of knowledge about Lincoln's uh, role as a lawyer, and particularly on the Eighth Circuit uh, when he was a uh, writer there. So I knew some of the university, and I knew some of Lincoln. I had always heard, but never really got to the bottom of what precise documents Lincoln drafted and what uh, the import, their import was. We were able in this uh, effort of ours to identify and specify with the help of the archivist 
uh, April Zorn, um, those documents, and they're now in this book. And I guess more than the documents to me, I became aware of the, what I'm going to call the mutual loyalty that the university's leaders and Fell and Hovey and David Davis had with Lincoln and the university's ties to Lincoln through those uh, personal relationships and Lincoln's loyalty to the university. The more you get into the book, I think you'll find that recurring theme, whether it's um, the fact that our students were drilling at the end of their school day in preparation for what they thought and what university officials thought was going to be the Civil War. So all of that loyalty, that mutual loyalty came out. So I encouraged and supported Tom in his, his enormous effort. He had done 37 books and won 14 different awards from Illinois Historical Society. So I knew that he would fully explore this task. The decade of 1855 to 1865 is one of the most important decades in our country's history. It saw Illinois' first public institution Illinois State, founded during the upheaval of all this pre-war uh, rhetoric and, to some extent, preparation. The very first student, Enoch Gassman, Jr., entered Old Majors Hall in October of 1857, well prior to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the South Carolina secession, and the elections of 1858-1860 and 1864. This then was the crucible in which Illinois State's heritage was forged, and one that is not shared by any other public university. I want to thank Mr. Kemp, you, Ms. Summers, Mr. Potter, who I know, Mr. McDonald, uh, for inviting us and letting us share what uh, we were able to discern. I have the book here in front of me, and the title is Abraham Lincoln and the Heritage of Illinois State University. It's available in your bookshop. Um, there are a number of copies there, but if you're not there, but you want to get, get it in Bloomington Normal, it's at Campus Town Supply, uh, Sprague Superstation, uh, the David Davis Mansion, Barnes & Noble Campus uh, Bookstore. So there are plenty of places where you can obtain it if you want. It's uh, $22.95. It retails for $22.95. I think, and I'm biased admittedly, I think you will find the book most informational and more importantly to me, inspirational. I hope you enjoy today's discussion. Thank you, Carl. Um, Carl's such a modest gentleman. He's one of the finest people I know, and I'm certainly proud to have been associated with him through this. Um, we laugh about this. We started talking about this book. We've talked about it for a while. But we finally came up with the finalizing idea of doing it on the parking lot of a local Walmart one night. We said we should have a meeting and get, get on this. A lot of the planning sessions for this before the um, all the shutdowns from COVID took place just across the street from here at local Hardee's over coffee and juice several times. But um, um, I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why it's important that people understand the connections, and I say the many connections of Illinois State to Lincoln. Uh, I'm going to just kind of hit the high points because I was going to talk about all of them. We could be here for hours. Or that's why there's so many. Like I say, this book ended up being three times long as we thought it would. Uh, I'm going to start with the years actually before Illinois State was founded. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the man who is the single biggest reason Illinois State is located in Bloomington Normal, and that is Jesse Fell. 
Uh, Jesse Phelps, a close friend of Lincoln, who was a energetic businessman who had his hand in everything. And I'll talk about that here shortly. One modern account called Fell a Dynamo. David Davis, who was also in Bloomington, as you know, called, said that Fell had more energy and force of character than any man he had ever known. And that's very true. Fell amassed great wealth in real estate. He secured not one, but two major railroads, the Chicago and Alton and Illinois Central, to be routed through Bloomington, which is a tremendous economic advantage for a growing city. He owned the predecessor of the Bloomington Pantograph. He helped found the city of Clinton, also helped play, also helped found or played key roles in the development of Lexington, Tawanda, Leroy, El Paso, White, Decatur, Joliet, as well as the town of Larchwood, Iowa. Uh, he helped found Livingston County, helped name the county seat of Pontiac. He owned land in Chicago, Milwaukee, as well, and made various editions of Bloomington, which you'll still see on uh, the flat books and the uh, abstractors graphs. And that's just a few of the things he did. I could go on about Fell. But importantly, he also saw the advantages of having a university in Bloomington. And as uh, was written by in David Fell in his 1907 history, that Fell saw the advantages of building up an intelligent community, also the pecuniary, the financial, intellectual, and moral advantages of the university in Bloomington. He saw the big picture as Fell always did. He worked tirelessly to raise subscriptions, ensuring that Bloomington would top its competitors, namely Peoria, because Peoria is making a strong bid for the university as well. Fell pledged over a half million dollars in today's value, today's dollars, he created the quad, the beautiful Illinois State University quad, which we'll talk about later on today. But along the way, he also became close friends with Lincoln, who he had met in Vandalia in 1834-35, winter of 34-35, when Fells worked as a lobbyist at the time. Lincoln was in his first term of four in the Illinois State Legislature. He had encouraged Lincoln to debate Douglas as early as 1854, which is four years before Lincoln actually did debate Douglas. Uh, like Lincoln, he was against the Mexican War. He had a hatred of slavery, like Lincoln. As Lincoln had matriculated from the Whigs Republicans, so did Fell. Uh, Lincoln had stayed at Fell's grand home, uh, Greenwood, on many occasions. Uh, university historians believe that Fell influenced the hiring of Lincoln as counsel of the Board of Education, which helped found the university. Uh, Lincoln never charged a fee for this. We have found we found no indication that Lincoln ever charged a fee to the State Board of Education, which oversaw the university in its infant days. Uh, Fell is also remembered for his role in the ascent of Lincoln to the presidency. He persuaded Lincoln to write an autobiography. That sounds kind of simple. But Lincoln wrote three autobiographies in his life. Two of them were extremely short. The second one, which Fell influenced, was only about 600 words. Um, Fell had been contacted by a newspaper editor friend from back home, Pennsylvania, named Joseph Lewis, who had become interested in Lincoln as the vice president as when he gained some support as vice presidential nominee in 19, 1856. He did not get the nomination with Brownsville's support. So Fell gets on Lincoln, let's get an autobiography. Write something up on yourself so we can send this out to Lewis in Pennsylvania. Lincoln being Lincoln refused. Fell persists, like Fell would do. Uh, finally, Lincoln sits down and writes an autobiography of 600 words in December of 1859. Says the, mails it to Fell and says, there's not much of it, I suppose, because there's not much of me. Lincoln, the ever self-deprecating individual. Uh, Lewis and Pennsylvania published it, went to other papers, and it really helped introduce Lincoln to Eastern voters. Uh, scholars today say that was a key moment in introducing Lincoln to voters in the East. It became the first widely bi read biographical sketch of Lincoln in the words of one scholar. It played a critical role in the election of Lincoln, as it was Fellwood in the next year when Lincoln was running for president in 1860. He was worked with, fell worked closely with David Davis, the campaign manager of the 1860 Republican National Convention, resorted to crafty and extreme measures to fill the halls, make it sound like Lincoln had a lot more support, which helped ensure Lincoln's nomination for president on the third ballot. He maintained contact with Lincoln in the White House, had a paymaster's position through the Civil War. The fell is, without question, the reason the university is located in Bloomington. Had not been for Jesse Fell, if Illinois State had even come to exist, it likely would not be in Bloomington today. It may have been in Peoria, which was a top competitor. Also, Batavia and Washington are making room for it as well. Fell's the reason your university is there, and we're all glad for that. Uh, he's also, without question, the man most responsible for the growth and development of Bloomington North. 
and is, like I said, likely the reason Lincoln was connected to the university in the first place. I wish we had, I, if I was doing this in person, I'd be asking questions now. Like uh, Candace said, please uh, submit your questions. We'll try to uh, get those in at the end of the presentation. I'm going to try to keep this within an hour, so I hope I'm not boring you too much for some of this. Uh, some of you may have heard me talk about Bloomington Public Library and other topics before. If you did, thank you for coming back. I'm glad I didn't bore you enough the first time. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, I'm going to talk very brief about Lincoln's relationship with the first university president, Charles Hovey. The extent of his relationship with Hovey is unclear, but we certainly knew each other. Uh, I think what's interesting with Hovey is that he had traveled with Fell to Washington in July of 1861, hoping for a military commission, hoping to have for authorization to raise this concept of a teacher's regiment, a school teacher's or schoolmaster's regiment, which became the 33rd Illinois, we'll touch on a site later on. Fell and Hovey were in Washington at the time of First Bull, the Battle of First Bull Run, July 21st, 1861, the first major uh, military action in the East. They actually saw the battle in person, like many others. They rode horses and buggies out to the battlefield. The Washington elite thought this would be a great opportunity for a picnic. If you can imagine going to Civil War battle for a picnic. Uh, the Federals were defeated in a headlong route, which really caught, uh, completely upset the day and caused a massive traffic jam of buggies trying to escape back to Washington with the fleeing troops. Hovey grabbed an abandoned rifle and headed for the enemy, and that's in the words of Helen Marshall, the, long, the noted university historian who wrote... Um, the centennial history, centennial history of the University in 1957. Fell, being more prudent, worked with wounded in the improvised military hospitals, field hospitals there. It was through this um, visit that Hovey may have spoken to Lincoln about the idea of a teacher's regiment, which was approved. And 25 days later, Hovey was commissioned colonel of the unit, which became the 33rd Illinois, one of the great stories of the Civil War in Illinois and of Illinois State University on the whole. Uh, I have to do this. Um, if for all, all those of you who read about the Civil War, study the Civil War, or if you can just watch some of the Civil War movies, such as a movie Gettysburg, Ted Turner's movie from 1993, you're no doubt familiar with the name Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Uh, Chamberlain, who had been a professor at Bowdoin you know, College in Maine before the war, is often lionized, for lack of a better word, exaggerated because he was a volunteer soldier. I find this interesting because it was a volunteer war. Most of the men in the Civil War were volunteers. But for all the fame that Chamberlain has received being a college man, college professor, going off to war, what about a guy like Charles Hovey, a university president going off to war in a volunteer situation? He could have sat, stayed in Bloomington and continued running his university, but he wanted to be out in the fight. And I think this goes back to how this, one of the many, many, many ways that the university supported University of Sport Lincoln and the war effort. And I think Hubby kind of embodies that. Um, Hubby was a uh, brevet major general at the end of the war. He fought with great distinction at the Battle of Cash River, Arkansas in July of 1862, and he suffered two severe wounds in the Battle of Arkansas Post, which was early in the Vicksburg campaign in early 1863. Um, Hubby may have had a, was quite egotistical to read about him, but it was his sheer will that built that university from what it was. And I think he deserves great accolades for his Civil War service. And that goes back to Lincoln as well. Um, at this point, I'd like to bring you to the I, what really drew Carl and I into this project. The fact that Lincoln served as a counsel for the Board of Education in the formation of Illinois State University. And I think this is Lincoln's greatest contribution to your university. I know a lot of you are Illinois State grads. I've laughed. I'm the only person in this room today here that's not an Illinois State grad. Carl is. <laughs> Nadi, our tech person, is. Uh, Candace is running this. I'm the only person that's not, and I'm kind of envious of all of you because it's such a, it's a truly special place. It's a remarkable university with a remarkable story, and I'm honored to have been able to contribute to something. I hope if you read the book, you'll agree. Uh, Lincoln, though, served as a counsel of the Board of Education at the university's early stage. At the time, the State Board of Education oversaw the university's founding, first and foremost, but also its growth and it, it, it oversaw the university in its earliest years. Lincoln wrote the guarantee to secure funding for the school that was being founded. That helped ensure that it would be in Bloomington as well. It is not at all surprising that Lincoln was chosen to serve as counsel of the board. He knew many people in Bloomington, such as Jesse Fell, David Davis, and others. He had argued many cases there as part of the Eighth Judicial Circuit. Uh, 
he was a familiar Bloomington. I, I counted up in the, eight, the late 1850s. Lincoln was in Bloomington several dozen days. I mean, he was there for quite a bit. Uh, he was very familiar to the people there, and they were familiar to him. Outside of Springfield, and this, this is without question, outside of Springfield, no Illinois city had the impact on Lincoln's career as did Bloomington. You're not going to win the argument if you say any, any place else. Bloomington is second only to Springfield in the importance of Lincoln's pre presidency. He spoke there on multiple occasions, like the lost speech, which we'll cover later. Uh, but was Lincoln really interested in education? Is that why he chose to support the uh, Board of Education and Service Council? He was interested in education, but uh, he did not have an impressive record at, on education as state legislature from 34 to, 34 to 42. It would appear that it was more of a political thing that he served on the board as served as council of the board as a political favor to his friends, such as Jesse Felt, because it was said he did not charge a fee for his services. There's no record of Lincoln charging a dime for his services to the Illinois State Norman, which the university is called back then. The board at the time is a 15 member panel, which has several Lincoln associates on it, friends and associates. To pay for this university, several fundraising efforts have to be taken. I'll be very quick about this. First, McLean County appropriates $50,000 from proceeds from the sales of government land. Then Fell, and there's that name again, Fell ties through this university time and time again. We'll talk about him several times today. Uh, collects 50,000 individual subscriptions. So he goes to the individuals to chip in money to strengthen Bloomington's bid. I mentioned several cities want the university, namely Peoria. Fell ends up saying a sort of secret agent, Peoria, in the uh, spring of 1857. To determine the strength of their bid. The agent comes back and tells Fell that yes, Bjorn's in danger of copying Bloomington. They may get the university and they win the bidding. Fell, indomitable will, goes back to subscribers. He gets them a chip in another $21,000. Think about that, $1857. Uh, the, the county adds $20,000 as well. So Bloomington's entire bid ends up being $141,000. It's easily the highest. On May 7th, 1857, in a meeting of the board, the university is awarded to Bloomington, but there's a caveat with this. If Bloomington cannot fulfill the conditions of the subscriptions in 60 days, the agreement will be voided and the university is in danger of being awarded to Peoria. So you need a guarantee. You need something to back this. You need something to, to make this, you know, to, to confirm, reaffirm this agreement. And I'm saying this in layman's terms. Carl is an outstanding lawyer. He can tell you this better than I could. But, uh, but and I will say this. I worked harder on this particular chapter, what we're talking about the guarantee, than any chapter in any book I've ever written in my life. It was, it was, it was something doing this one. Carl and I really, really hammered this one out. And I do want to say, just, just so you know a little story here, Carl is just incredible to work with. I think the only thing we ever disagreed on in the whole book was whether we should put an exclamation point at the end of one sentence. I think it's the only thing we ever disagreed on, and I, I held out. I, I won that one. But uh, Carl was just super to work with. But he could tell you a lot more about guarantees. As any of you who are either attorneys yourselves or work in the legal industry, I'm saying this for all of us that are not legally minded. Um, if you don't have a guarantee, there's every reason, every reason that you're going to lose the university because there's – the Panic of 1857 comes on. This really makes this important later on. Uh, there's an executive committee on the board, again, has many Lincoln associates, and they hire Lincoln as, as counsel to secure the subscriptions. Fell goes to work, gets $218,000. Again, think about how much the value this is in 1857. To secure the guarantee, it's three more times they need it. And Lincoln writes it up. On May 15th, the guarantee is written according to a bond drawn by, this is how it's worded, A. Lincoln Esquire. There's a note, there's a, it's the first reference of Lincoln in any board minutes. It's published in the Bloomington Panograph from May 20th, 1857. Also makes one of the Springfield papers. So it's out there. I mean, this isn't that behind the scenes. It's public record Lincoln is involved in this university as such. Again, the guarantee becomes particularly important as a panic of 1857 sends land values plummeting. It jeopardized subscriptions because some of the subscriptions are not coming through as 1857 progresses. There's some talk among the board that Lincoln may be hired again as a sort of collection agent to enforce the subscriptions. If you promise you, you're going to give money to the university, they're going to make you give it to them. That never had to happen because Lincoln was not uh, was not hired as such as a as a de facto collection agent. Um, 
There were also seven individuals who donated land, which are guaranteed by bonds, and we believe that Lincoln wrote those bonds. Previous research has shown that we believe that Lincoln drafted those bonds as well. Is that how you would say it, Carl? Yes. Yes, that's, that's how, you know, I want to make sure we're clear on that one. Um, Lincoln may have formed other legal work for the board. We know he was in town on the same date as at least two other board meetings throughout the uh, year of 1857. So Lincoln's role in the university's formation is of great importance. It really can't be understated. Uh, he enabled the university, allowed it to be formed, in so many words, and secured it for Bloomington with his actions. So the fact that Lincoln is there at the beginning is of great importance. And like I say, there's only one university in the world that Lincoln had a hand in founding, and Illinois University is at. And I think that is a great, great part of the story. There's a looking for Lincoln mark on South University Street that interprets this to a point, but not as much as, as we have, sir. And like I said, if you have questions, please submit those. Candace will be uh, filtering those to us later on. Uh, there was ample support for Lincoln within the university community as he was elected through the war and after his assassination. I'll touch on that very briefly. McLean County provided some of the strongest downstate support for any of any county in Illinois for Lincoln. Lincoln's strength in Illinois was Chicago and collar counties. That was really put him over the top in 1860 and 1864. We're talking about Cook, Kane, uh, Kendall, Lake, DuPage, uh, Grundy, Will going to South, Winnebago, if you're going even over toward um, Rockford. That was Lincoln's strength in polling in Illinois. As it got further south, it really became iffy. McLean County is one of the few bona fide downstream strongholds that he had. Uh, the county gave him 57% vote in 1860, about 61% in 1864. Bloomington voted for him 61.6% in 1860, and about two-thirds of the vote, 66% in 1864. It was the same in Norman. McLean County supported Lincoln much more than Sagamon County, Lincoln's home county support. I think that is of note. Um, and that's where we talked about the exclamation point just a few minutes ago. That was yeah. where we talked debated the exclamation point. Um, the only thing we ever disagreed on in a year, about a year of work, the exclamation point. I, I still laugh about that. Um, Lincoln actually carried his own hometown, Springfield, by only 10 votes, 1324 to 1314 in his 1864 reelection campaign. He could count more support from McLean County than his own, his own backyard. Uh, the university supported him the polls as well, although there was support for Douglas on campus. It was not universal, but Lincoln had ample support among the university students at the time. Lincoln and the war of frontline issues on campus throughout the uh, 1860 and 1861. The Dred Scott decision came only 16 days after the university had been founded legally in 18, on February 18, 1857. Dred Scott was an early issue on, important issue on campus since early time. We mentioned the 33rd Illinois, the famed Teachers Regiment. That's the most noteworthy example of students supporting Lincoln through the war by serving Union surveillance. Uh, the, you know, that had its roots on campus, Carlin Kid, as the normal rifles, which had been drilled on and near the campus as part of the educational work of the school, and that's a quote for people at the time. Puffy was a driving force behind this. When the unit was mustered in the 33rd, it included 46 normal university, Illinois State normal, students and teachers. And all 117 members of the university, think about the enrollment at the time, served in the war. And one uh, scholar said that every man of the first three classes that graduated from Illinois State normal, 1860, 61, and 62, served in the war except those who were physically disabled and able to. The, uh, a lot of those guys went on to stellar careers in education after they became leaders in state national education. Some went on to found other education institutions, the founding presidents. Uh, some, none of those guys have elementary schools, high schools named after them today. They held uh, statewide positions of importance in education. A lot of the men who served in Civil War from Illinois State Normal were education leaders throughout their lives. And I think that's one of the great legacies of the men who served from Illinois State Normal. Uh, the 33rd served in Missouri, Arkansas, served in the Battle of Vicksburg. They were in the frontal assault on Vicksburg on, on May 22nd, 1863. There are 106 men from Illinois who received the Medal of Honor in the Civil War. 43 of them received them on that day, the brutal frontal assault on Vicksburg, May 22nd, 1863. I think that is extremely noteworthy for the type of combat the 33rd was in. 
uh, I mentioned the Battle of Cache River in July of 1862. One of the normal men, Edward Pike, won the Medal of Honor there. So of those 106 men from Illinois who won the Medal of Honor, one was a normal student. Uh, when Lincoln was assassinated, when he died from, a, from being shot, he died on at 727, 722 excuse me, a.m. on April 15th, 1861. The university, like the rest of the nation, was really shattered by this. There's a memorial exercise held in Old Main, the uh, main campus building, on April 19th, 1865. The second university president, Richard Edwards, delivered a 19 page speech in which he touched on Lincoln's emancipation as well as the 13th Amendment. Oddly enough, to not mention Lincoln's connections to the university, I find that very unusual. Lincoln's uh, legacy was also seen in a movement to admit black students to Illinois State um, in, a, in a heated and stirring meeting on April 24, 1867, which is one of the finest moments in Illinois State University history. The university is very proud of that moment, as they should be. I should also mention, I skipped over this by accident, the funeral train carrying Lincoln's body came through the air, it says around Bloomington Normal early in the morning of May 3rd, 1865 in Tawana and Lexington and Channel One, place like that. Huge crowds came out in the middle of the night, we're talking about two, three, four in the morning, singing funeral dirges, uh, honoring the, missing, the, the fallen president, the martyred president. He arrived in Normal about 5 a.m. Uh, the train went under, went, drove underneath near the university, a decorative arch that was inscribed with the words, go to thy rest. It said that half the population of Bloomington came out, like I said, about five in the morning to honor the martyred president. And I think that really says something. Again, normal students were there. On the centenary of Lincoln's birth, February 12th, 1909, the university held what we call the Lincoln Day Exercises, because as a index, the Illinois State University yearbook of the time said that Lincoln, in a sense, was one of the founders of the university. The daughter of Jesse Fell, Fanny Fell, read the original autobiography of Lincoln's that he had written for her father in 1859, as the spirit of Lincoln lingered over the university, as it does today. Uh, we're going to run a little short on time, so I'm going to try to hit some of the high points of the book and some of the key figures of why Lincoln was involved with this university, but also, too, Lincoln's many, many connections to the university. We'll try to get some of those, as many of those in as we can today. We're going to start with David Davis, who donated $8,000 in land to the university, which is equivalent to $237,000 today. The land is in the general area of Hancock Stadium, where the Aussie Redbird football team plays. Davis played an array of key roles in Lincoln's life and political sense. Many credit Lincoln's election as president in 1860 to David Davis. He managed Lincoln's presidential campaign in 1860. Jesse Fell said once, you wrote, wrote Lincoln that you have no truer, more devoted friend and admirer than David Davis, whom Lincoln had met in Vandalia in 1835. They become acquainted on the 8th Judicial Circuit, Lincoln had argued 1,685 cases in front of David Davis through, their, through the time of the circus. They were very familiar with each other. Davis had worked with Lincoln on his failed bid for the Senate in 1855, three years before the great debate with Douglas. And Lincoln managed the, the great 1860 presidential nomination and campaign. Um, he rounded up volunteers, filled seats at the, in the National Convention in Chicago, a temporary building called the Wigwam to, again, ensure the shouting, the, uh, the presence of all of Lincoln's support, which helped Lincoln uh, gain the nomination on the third ballot. He basically devoted the entire summer of 1860 to Lincoln. Uh, Davis's biographer, Willard King, who wrote an interesting book on Davis in 1960, said that L Davis's chief contribution to American history was the part he played in the nomination of Lincoln. Jesse Fell said, it's much true, that people of America are indebted to Davis for the nomination of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln sometimes stayed at Davis's home when he's visiting uh, Bloomington. He appointed Davis to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1862. He's a third of five Lincoln appointees to the U.S. Supreme Court. Davis was also the executor of Lincoln's estate after the assassination. On the afternoon that Lincoln died, Lincoln's eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, wired Davis, please come to Washington and take care of father's affairs. Um, Robert saw Davis as a second father, even though Davis hated Mary Todd Lincoln, Robert Smith. Uh, Davis carefully handled Lincoln State and increased its value. Davis actually held the papers of Abraham Lincoln in Bloomington for a time after, in the years after Lincoln's death, where Robert allowed them to be used by John Hay and John Nicolay in their landmark 10-volume uh, work published in 1890. 
So think about that. Davis is not only Lincoln's, we got dark here. We, not, not even we got dark here. Battery power is low, it says. Let's see. I saw battery power there. We're saying we're plugged in here. What do you think? We're okay. I'm going to okay. run in. Okay. All, All right. right. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep talking. If we give out, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, so think about that. Davis, not only was the executive of Lincoln Estate, but also um, held Lincoln's papers in Bloomington. Again, another key figure in the early years of Illinois State University with the tie to Lincoln. As did Ninian Work Edwards, who was the president of the Board of Education, the first president of the State Board of Education. And he was Lincoln's brother in law. His wife, Elizabeth Edwards, was Mary Todd Lincoln's sister. Ninian had been also the chair of the board's executive committee, and it's entirely possible that Ninian may be the reason that Lincoln was secured for the board as counsel. I refer back to Fell. If Fell was not the reason, Ninian Edwards probably was. Uh, Ninian was the son of Ninian Edwards Sr., the third governor of Illinois history, had been the territorial governor of Illinois, and the man who Edwardsville and Edwards County are named for. Ninian Edwards Sr. is a towering figure in early, the infant days of Illinois history. N uh, Ninian Jr. is credited with running the first school law in the state of Illinois. He had been one of the long nine legislators with Lincoln in 1836 uh, from Sagamon County. He was instrumental, well, the long nine was instrumental in helping vote to move the capital from Vandalia to Springfield. We have Nadia working behind us, see if we can get some pencil with the difficulties to take care of here. But Ninian Jr. had a very rocky relationship with Abraham Lincoln. Ninian has been described as vain and imperious, snobbish, aristocratic, hot tempered and egotistical. Um, he rarely supported Lincoln politically. Even though he's Lincoln's brother in law, he rarely supports him politically. He usually votes for Douglas. Whoever's running against Lincoln, that's who Ninian is usually supporting. Uh, Ninian and his wife did not approve of the courtship of Mary Todd and Lincoln uh, because they felt that Mary was too good for him and that Lincoln was way beneath uh, the status symbol that, that Mary had, the Edwards family as a whole. Mary actually lived in the Edwards home for most of the time that her and Lincoln courting. And the, but when the Lincolns did eventually marry, they did so in the Edwards home on the 4th, 1842. Mary actually died in the Edwards home on July 16, 1882. Ninian had run into deep financial trouble through his life. He actually borrowed from money from Lincoln, defaulted on it, and then still did not support Lincoln politically. Lincoln finally appointed him as a commissary captain in 1861. Ninian blew that amid charges of corruption, which infuriated the people back home in Springfield. Lincoln finally had to remove him from his post in 1863. So Ninian is a, Ninian, the connection of Ninian Edwards to Lincoln is key to the university, although Ninian does not cut a very good picture. And what, what do we have, Nadia? What do you think? Uh, there are two legislators that founded the introduced bill to found Illinois State and General Assembly, and Lincoln had ties to both them. The bills were found, were introduced in the legislation in July of 1850, January, excuse me, 1857. Samuel Moulton was a House member who introduced the first bill to establish Illinois State and the Board of Education. <clears throat> he is from Shelbyville, and his home still stands on the south side of Shelbyville. He served on the Board of Education until 1876. He was connected to Lincoln on at least 40 legal cases, and it appeared it was some call debate with Lincoln in Shelbyville in 1856. Lincoln appointed him to post to the war as well. Moulton, along with Charles Hovey, actually borrowed several thousand dollars of their own money to help keep Illinois State afloat in its early days, which demonstrates his commitment to the university. In the Senate, the member who introduced the bill was Joel Seth Post, a Decatur attorney, who was connected to at least 34 legal cases. So both the gentlemen who introduced the bills to found the Board of Education in Illinois State Normal had ties to Lincoln. Touch briefly on some of the subscribers. Um, the men who, found, who financed the university, the people that chipped in money, <clears throat> either from the individual subscription guarantee to make sure the university would A, have money to exist, but B, still be in Bloomington. Many of the subscribers are friends and associates of Lincoln, including Leonard Sweat. The Bloomington attorney is one of Lincoln's closest friends. It's been written that Lincoln preferred his association to Sweat to any other lawyer in the state. Uh, they've traveled on the eighth judicial circuit together and often share beds. That's un you wouldn't think that attorneys or judges would be sharing beds today, but they did in the 1850s, on the 40s, and 1850s on the legal circuit. Sweat and Lincoln often shared a bed. It's been said that one reason Sweat would sometimes sleep with Lincoln is because no one wanted to sleep with David Davis because he weighed over 300 pounds and hogged up too much of the bed. 
That was one reason people didn't want to sleep with him. Sure, I bet. Uh, Sweat worked closely with Davis, the 1860 Republican National Convention, and accompanied Lincoln to Gettysburg in November of 1863. He held minor appointments under Lincoln as well, but he also played a pivotal role in having Mary Todd Lincoln institutionalized in May of 1875, because he too was close to Robert Todd Lincoln. Then we just kicked off an audio. All right. I wrote Thank you all for bearing with us on our technical issues. I am sure that um, Carl and uh, Tom will be back shortly. Um, so please do stick around uh, while we get the power situation figured out. And I will take this opportunity. Um, they have been mentioning a lot of uh, people through uh, local connections. Oh, it looks like they're coming back. But um, if you haven't seen our Abraham Lincoln and McLean County exhibit at the museum lately, uh, please do stop by and check it out because a lot of Lincoln's local friends, such as Leonard Sweat, David Davis, Jesse Fell, are all covered in that exhibit. Um, so you can learn more about those people. And I will turn it back over to uh, Tom and Carl because they are back with Battery Power now. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me and all see me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so we will continue. Uh, we're picking up with the subscribers and men who financed the university in its early days. I'll talk first about Oshel Gridley, who the town of Gridley is named for. A great friend of Lincoln's, but hardly a friend of anyone else's. Uh, he has been described as boisterous, opportunistic, ill-mannered, profane, arrogant, and hateful. Nobody likes Oshel Gridley, apparently. A lot of people refuse to speak to him on the streets of Bloomington. He is a powerhouse in business, though, and controls much of the economic goings-on of Bloomington and the town of North Bloomington, which would later become normal, certainly Bloomington. Uh, he served with Lincoln in the state legislature, worked with Lincoln on 105 cases, and was connected with Lincoln in McLean County more than any other lawyer. He later gave up the law for business and turned his practice over to Lincoln. who had to represent Gridley in a case a few years later against uh, a top Bloomington businessman who Lincoln said, the businessman said Gridley had, per had slandered him. This is not unusual because Gridley just does this to people. And Lincoln sees upon this and saying, and these are the words of Guy Fraker, Carl mentioned the tremendously skilled legal story from the Bloomington area, uh, that it was, Lincoln presented the case to defend Gridley that it was common knowledge that Gridley habitually made untrue pejorative statements about everybody, so it was not slander. So Lincoln got him off. Now think about that one. But Gridley actually donated as much as $100,000 to Lincoln's presidential campaigns. Along with Fell, he helped influence the writing of the railroads through Bloomington. He lived on a home on East Grove Street, which cost a total of $1.3 million today to build in 1859. According to local legend, and I say this local legend, uh, Gridley's marriage was as volatile as his uh, relationships with everyone else. As he was nearing older age, he was asked if he was afraid of hell, to which he responded, not one bit. I've been in hell since the day I was married. <laughs> For her part, his wife refused to supply Osh with warm clothes in his dying days because she said it would take too much effort to wash them. <laughs> and I guess on the day of his funeral, she ordered the casket be taken out the front of the back door because, quote, the rugs have taken enough punishment. Oh my <laughs> um, I could tell you more stories, but we don't have time. And that is according to local legend, I will say that. On a happy note, there's William McCullough, uh, the, who served as McLean County Sheriff and McLean County Circuit Clerk. He's a one-armed gentleman. He lost his uh, arm in a threshing accident. He was nearly 50 when he joined the uh, service, which is past the age limit, traditional age limit of 45 at the time. He was killed in action in Mississippi in 1862. His daughter, Fanny, was distraught over her, the loss of her father. Lincoln penned a beautiful note to her, which is called the Fanny McCullough letter, which scholar Mark Neely called one of the greatest letters of condolence ever. William McCullough had been a financial supporter of the university, and again, this tied Lincoln. Lincoln comes up again, and I reprint the Fanny McCullough letters. You can find many places. I reprint that in the book. It is a very touching letter, very thoughtful to what Lincoln was really all about. I will touch very briefly on another subscriber. There are many, and I'm just going to head on a couple of days. Dr. Eli Crothers, who was tied with Lincoln in the uh, so-called chicken bone case in the law. 
The chicken bone case began with a fire in downtown Bloomington. Bloomington has been hit by a number of destructive fires in its illustrious history. One on October 17, 1855, wiped out a number of buildings. One man, Samuel Fleming, who was, I believe, himself a subscriber to the university, broke both of his legs when a chimney fell on him that was collapsing through the fire. Dr. Crothers set both of his legs, but the right leg did not heal, so it was recommended that he would have to re-break the leg to reset it. Um, Fleming apparently could not stand the pain in the procedure, told Crothers to stop. Crothers said, if you do, uh, the leg will not heal properly. Uh, so he stopped. The leg did not heal properly, and Fleming ended up suing Crothers over it. Lincoln represented Crothers and used a pair of old chicken bones to illustrate how young and old bones uh, mature, how they heal, how they bend. Uh, it was one, it's become a favorite of Lincoln scholars for its humor and practicality. So they, um, and I'm seeing uh, Candace is saying you can read about all these people from the great research biographies you have with the McLean County Historic, uh, History Museum. It is, uh, that is a great resource you have, and I'm certainly glad. Thank you for Candace for putting those up so people can read more about them as you can in our book as well. Um, I will mention one board member. Lincoln had many connections to early board members. I will mention one in particular, John McClune, a Bloomington judge. Lincoln actually sued, had sued him for a promissory note early in his career. Lincoln had no problem with suing his friends. He would have, he had no problem with representing against his friends and associates in court. Lincoln was a very practical lawyer. He stuck by the letter of the law. He was known for his adherence to the law. And if it involved friendships, well, so be it. Uh, I mentioned McLuhan because he had been treasurer of the original Board of Education, as well as a de facto treasurer of the university in its first years. He had also donated to the guaranteeing the subscriptions. <laughs> he had one of the most direct relationships to Lincoln as one of the few individuals that you will see in the board minutes or any type of documentation that is connected in some way to Abraham Lincoln in the early days of the university's uh, formation. McClune was actually authorized to employ Lincoln to collect money for the guarantee, which I mentioned earlier, which did not have to happen. But McClune is one of the few individuals who's directly mentioned in connection to Lincoln's early service to the board. One of the last things I want to talk to you about today there are two side topics now before I let you go, and I hope you're all not saying, thank goodness I'm letting you go. I hope you're all enjoying this as much as we're enjoying bringing this to you. One thing I want to talk about today is the site of the lost speech and the site of the first class at Illinois State University, which is another tie to Lincoln all its own, Majors Hall. One of the closest ties to Lincoln the University is a building that no longer exists, and that is Majors Hall a three-story building on the southwest corner of East and Front Street in Bloomington, which was demolished in 1959. That was the site of the first classes at Illinois State University. Illinois State University's classes were held for three years in this building, while the first permanent campus structure, Old Main, was being constructed. It would not be completed until 1860. Um, it was also the site of Lincoln's lost speech. It was a link, one of Lincoln's strongest, earliest statements against slavery, and it left the crowd awestruck. Some consider the lost speech, which we'll talk about a little more here, better than his most famous speeches. Lincoln is one of the great orators of American history. If you think about such great uh, speeches as the Gettysburg Address, the Second Inaugural, the House Divided Speech, the Cooper Union Speech. Some believe the lost speech was the greatest of all. And I think that is a very strong and telling statement. Uh, the speech was delivered at the first Republican State Convention in Bloomington on the late afternoon of May 29th. 1856. Um, the um, chairman of the first convention was from here in Cardinalville, John Palmer, who had gone to be one of the better governors of Illinois history. He had gone to be a major general in the Civil War, uh, was elected governor in 1868, and is one of the hallmark figures of 19th century Illinois political history, some say even more so than Stephen A. Douglas, which I think is very telling. He's the chairman of this convention. It takes in some of the Anti Nebraska, I see. Thank, thanks, Sonia, for the um, for, for the comments. I see those. Thank you very much. Um, um, the Republican State Convention is a collection of anti Nebraska Democrats, ex Whigs, people looking for a new political home. So it's kind of a hodgepodge meeting at Majors Hall over these two days in May of 1856. The second day of the convention has a packed house, 1,100 people, including 275 delegates on the third floor of Majors Hall. People are staying in the aisles, on the stairs, in windows. At the time, the building was only three years old. 
the building house things like grocery stores, uh, very workman-like things, everyday businesses on the first two floors, and the auditorium on the third floor. Lincoln is not even on the program, and he's called to speak on this second day. And that's not that surprising if you think about it. Lincoln, at the time, was not necessarily a household name even in Illinois. He'd served one term in Congress. He'd, been, he'd fallen short in a bid for the U.S. Senate in 1855 in a rather embarrassing loss for him. His, con his congressional term going back to that was very mixed. Uh, he had fallen short in uh, attempts to secure other political offices. So Lincoln, as he's saying in Majors Hall that day, saying, facing a rather uncertain political future. This is two years before he debates Douglas in 1858, four years before his presidency. At this time, we don't know where Lincoln's going. So he's not even on the program. There are calls for him to speak, and most people expect him to speak just for a few minutes. He's clutching a few scraps of paper. Uh, for about the first half hour of his speech, which is longer than you expect the time, it was, tip, it was kind of typical. But he ends up going for an hour and a half with an emotion that is extremely unusual for the normally reticent Lincoln. Elbow Chrissy, who was from Bloomington, who wrote an exhaustive and outstanding account of the lost speech in 1967, described Lincoln as fiery, emotional, reckless, violent and hot-blooded. It left the crowd spellbound, so much so that no one thought to take notes. This is why it's called the lost speech. That's not unusual that Lincoln's uh, speech has lost history. Many of Lincoln's orations, particularly in smaller towns across the state before he gained his fame, are lost to history. No one was there to take notes. Either the journalists were not there, they were too lazy, or no one thought to. What makes lost speech interesting, why no one did, is because of the magnitude of the venue the first Republican state convention, the fact that many of the state's top journalists are there, some of the most educated and, and well-bred men of the state are there, and no one's taking notes because they're also taken by Lincoln's speech. They, apparently no one thinks to do it. The only synopsis of the um, speech that is accepted is a 180-word passage in a newspaper in Alton, Illinois. There is also a reference in a newspaper in Belleville, which some people debate, uh, other accounts of the speech have been debunked. This is why it's called the lost speech. It's one of the most famous and legendary orations of Lincoln's uh, career, and we're not exactly sure what he said, which is kind of unfortunate. Dr. Wayne Temple, who reviewed this book, we have many beautiful reviews in this book. Dr. Temple has been called the greatest living Lincoln scholar. He lives in Springfield. Uh, he described the uh, speech as truly the pivot of Lincoln's life. It was one of the most important political addresses he ever made, and many people then and now feel the same way. It instantly established Lincoln as leader of the state Republicans, put him on the track to presidency, and that's the words of people who were there. He, three weeks later at the 1856 Republican National Convention in Philadelphia, Lincoln, kind of a dark horse candidate, had a ground of support for vice president. A lot of people felt the lost speech was kind of a springboard to Lincoln's political ascent. Lincoln spoke in Majors Hall twice afterward on September 12th and September 16th, 1856. But exactly 384 days after that second speech, the first classes in the history of Illinois State University are held in the same auditorium, Majors Hall. Charles Hoving, the university needed temporary quarters because they're, they're trying to build the, their first building, Old Main. Again, I said it would not be complete until 1860. Uh, the university came up very fast. The first, the, Vote in the legislature was on February 18, 1857. The first board meeting was on March 26, 1857. They met a few times, awarded the University of Bloomington. As of June, Charles Hovey and the early administrators determined they were going to open that fall. Now think about how fast this is all happening. They don't even have a place to have the have a university, let alone anything else. So they're able to create a curriculum, secure furniture, physical necessities, financing everything in literally just a few weeks. We talk about Hovey's indomitable will, that's a good part of it. It was uh, iron will that really forced that university to be open that year. Strangely enough, the bill, uh, Majors Hall now is only four years old, and it's fallen in some disrepair. Hovey and some of the other early officials talked about that they didn't need to paint. It was dirty, it was smoked up from the, uh, for, from the stoves that burned at the time. It was muddy, uh, but with, all do elbow grease, work, and everything else. It, the school opens on October 5th, 1857. 19 students show up that first morning, six men and 13 women. The first to register, as, as Carl said, 
Enoch Gassman, who was from Hudson, Illinois, who would be go on to a stellar career in education as many early Illinois State graduates did then and now. Uh, he would become the school, high school principal and school superintendent in a 47-year career in Decatur, Illinois. Illinois State held the classes in Majors Hall for three years before Old Main was open. Majors Hall then re reverted back to its everyday use. The third floor was wiped out in a fire in November of 1872, so the site of the lost speech is gone forever. The building fell into neglect and dilapidation, even though some, some citizens tried to save it in the 1950s. It was demolished in February of 1959. The markers at the site make it uh, say it was one of the most significant sites in Lincoln's pre presidency in Illinois and a very significant place for Illinois state history as well. The last thing I'd like to close with today, and if you have questions, please post them. So we'd be happy to take any of them if you're still with us, which we hope you are. The quad, for all, the, all of you who have graduated from Illinois State, from the Bloomington Normal area, the quad of Illinois State is a truly special place. It's just breathtakingly beautiful. Nadia is over there nodding your head. Carl, it means a lot to Carl. Or, yeah, Nadia had a horticulture degree, so that takes, she takes, yes. So she studied the plants there. Uh, the, uh, when I was on the quad the first time, I was just awestruck. It's such a beautiful place, such a lovely feature of the university, and you're also proud to have something like that. One of the many little known facts so there's a quad, quad connection to Lincoln as well. And that's a story all on its own, because a quad was designed by William Saunders, one of the foremost landscape architects of 19th century America. He is also credited with the design of Gettysburg National Cemetery, where Lincoln delivered his immortal Gettysburg Address. He also, he also designed Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, where Lincoln is buried. Fell had hired Saunders to design the landscape of Greenwood, uh, Fell's home in North Bloomington, which became a sort of public park called Fell Park. Fell was also working to secure Saunders for the university. In 1857, Saunders proposed an arboretum for the university grounds, and we reproduced the original design, the original plans, in our book. What was called a network of winding drives and walks with picturesque groves. Saunders charged the university a sum of $65 for his design. It was not implemented, however, until 1866, when Jesse Fell joined the board. Here's Fell again. He secures $3,000 in funding from the General Assembly the next year to landscape this fledgling university up in normal, what would become normal Illinois. Fell eventually plants 1,740 trees on campus, mostly his own trees, and that becomes the heart of the quad. Meanwhile, Saunders had gone on to great acclaim. We've, we'd like to know when William Saunders and Abraham Lincoln met. It is very plausible that they were introduced at Fell's home, Greenwood, when Lincoln was visiting there many times and Saunders would have been in town. It's very possible they met there. It's also very possible they met at the dedication of Oak Ridge Cemetery on May 24th, 1860, because we know that Lincoln attended that dedication with his wife, Mary Todd. However, there is no question that Abraham Lincoln and William Saunders met in the White House on November 17, 1863, two days before Lincoln's incomparable Gaysburg Address. Uh, Saunders had been hired to, for the design of what was called the Soldiers National Cemetery at Gaysburg, and he met with Lincoln to discuss the plans before Lincoln boarded the train to go to Gaysburg for his address. Saunders later remembered what an interest Lincoln took in discussing the cemetery. Lincoln was a very hands-on president, was a very curious president, and very interested in learning. That is not unusual that he would take a great interest in Saunders' designs. They talked at length about them. Lincoln was very pleased with the unusual arrangement of the graves, which have received world renown. Lincoln, Saunders actually back in Springfield at Oak Ridge Cemetery in August of 1865 for, and I'm quoting here, laying out and platting the monument grounds for the Lincoln tomb. Saunders did not design the tomb structure himself, but he designed the grounds and the surroundings. There are ample references in Springfield, Springfield newspapers of Saunders' presence in Springfield through the summer of 1865. So the ties of Quad to Lincoln is one of the great stories of the University in Lincoln. It's a story all its own, I think, one of the great and many connections of Abraham Lincoln to your wonderful university. I'm going to conclude here by saying that the story of Illinois State University is, in a word, remarkable. The history is just fascinating, and it's meteoric rise in the field of education, uh, teacher training, and as we're gone later today to go on to many other disciplines and become the outstanding national university is today. The story of Illinois State University is just incredible. Lincoln was there at the beginning. 
His legal wisdom and work helped secure the university for Bloomington. On the Board of Education, there were many of his relatives and friends, subscribers, the early donors, were more of his friends and associates. Men like Jesse Fell, in particular, David Davis, Leonard Sweat, were not only key players in university history, but also in McLean County and state history as well. The ties of the university found two of his great speeches, Lost Speech and the Gaysburg Address. He had relationships with early faculty, uh, which we do not have time to go into today. We do in the book in great detail. Early presidents, such as Hovey. Just as Lincoln was the dominant figure of 19th century Illinois history, the Adlai Stevenson family were the dominant figures of 20th century Illinois, uh, 20th century Illinois political history, and there are ties there as well as we examine the book. I think one of the fascinating things showing the Lincoln legacy just continues on and on. The book ended up three times longer than we expected because there was so much material. We had a lot of new material, new narrative. Of, we felt like we made a great contribution to Lincoln Studies. We've been told that. Um, thank you, Warren, for um, saying your comments. I appreciate that. Uh, our reviews are tremendous. We are very, very proud of that. I'll close by, as I close in the book, from a statement from Lucy Tasher, a longtime respected faculty member at Illinois State who wrote in 1956 that for the university, Abraham's Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's life became a message and a challenge to greatness. Even as Lincoln belongs to the ages, so does Illinois State belong to the future. And I think Ms. Tasher gave us the best quote we could say for the importance of Lincoln to the university. I'd like to thank you all for being here today. And if you have questions, please fire away because we're, we're happy to take them. Carl and I are both here. All right. Well, we did have one uh, put in the Q&A box. Um, was slavery the main motivation for Jesse Fell wanting Lincoln to be president, or did he want some federal recognition for Illinois? I think there are several reasons for it. Um, Fell and Lincoln shared their hatred of slavery. It's one reason that brought them together as uh, friendship. It brought their friendship. Fell was a Quaker, so that would have a lot to do with his dislike of slavery. I think Fell obviously saw the importance of Illinois in uh, Lincoln's presidency. I think not only his personal friendship, but he saw his professional ability. So I think it's a, it's a, that's a very good question. I think there are several reasons. I think slavery is certainly one of the reasons, yes, mm -hmm. or dislike of slavery. Excellent. Um, if anyone has uh, any other questions, please do um, drop them in the, the chat box. Uh, they'll be happy to, to answer those questions. Um, one question that, uh, that I have um, about writing the book, uh, how, long, like, how long did it take for you to put all this together? I'm sure it was a, a labor of love. Uh, our, I kind of say our official start date was, was December 12, 2019, when Carl and I received pretty much the go-ahead to do it. Uh, the book was printed and released on our, our release date officially is January 21st, 2021. Uh, it took me, I started writing it right out. I started researching it shortly before the pandemic hit. I started writing it the second week of the pandemic, actually, is when oh. I started writing it. Um, I'd say what it took me about seven months to write, would you say? Seven or eight. Yeah, I would say about seven or eight months to write this. So it was, 2020 was a bad year for much of the world. It was a great year for me because I, among other things, I had the opportunity to do this book. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. seven, seven to eight months of research and writing. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, in the, the Q&A. How much did Fell's reputation as an arborist help to diffuse the concern that there was not enough timber around Bloomington to build a university? That's a, that's a good question, Carl. Yeah. You, want to, you want to take that one on? Well, you know, uh, Fell, Fell's love for nature generally and uh, wonderful grounds uh, uh, specifically uh, tie him into Saunders directly. Not only did he have Saunders at his own place to devise um, plans, but when he could, he made sure that Saunders was in on the quad as planning. And then Fell himself did most of the planting on the quad. In terms of their worrying about adequate uh, wood supplies, I really, I think I'm, uh, I'm out of my league to answer that one. I don't think I know the answer to that one. And I think it would be a push if I, I opined in that area. Well, let me also say that Old Main was, was 
mainly brick, was it not? Yeah, mostly brick. Yeah, yeah my old main was not, was a brick structure. It was demolished in 1958. So I don't know how much of a concern they saw as timber at the time. As, as they did the planners actually see the term timber, that I cannot say. And I don't mean to step on anyone's toes as I say that. Um, I know that Huffy expressed concerns about the structural integrity of Old Main, which proved to be true later on. But uh, Old Main was a largely brick structure, and that was the, fir the first and only building in Illinois State for many years. Well, one other uh, side uh, note, uh, and it's very tangential, is that uh, the Fell's relationship with Saunders uh, was reinforced by the fact that Saunders was the person who developed the hybrid known as the navel orange, which we take for granted every day. But he's the gen, gen uh, what do you want to say? Uh, he, he, he modified the genes to produce the navel orange. All this in addition to his other landscaping work. That's something I was going to throw in. I just have time to do this. I'm glad you did, Carl, but that we can thank William Saunders and Abel Orange, too. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, so I want to thank uh, both you and Carl for uh, this afternoon's program and thank all of you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed this program and will join us for the next museum program on our webinar series, uh, Breaking Bread, Hot Dog, It Could Be Worst, German Cookery, on Tuesday, August 19th at 6 o'clock with uh, local historian Greg Koos, who will be um, sharing uh, information about the German American, American experience in McLean County. You can register to participate in uh, that free webinar by clicking the link that I just dropped in the chat. So I hope that all of you can join us for that as well. Um, and with that, I hope everyone uh, has a great rest of their day and uh, be safe and be well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.